on this Sunday night, rolling out the benefit package. Federal emergency money. Who qualifies? Who doesn't? Is it safe to remove residents out of care homes? Britain's Prime Minister in hospital after testing positive for COVID-19. Plus, a rare appearance from royalty in self-isolation. If we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. The Queen's message to the world. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. These are uncertain times, but for tens of thousands of Canadians whose livelihoods have been affected by the COVID-19 crisis, there is some relief coming. The application process for the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit begins tomorrow. It should ease the financial strain as we wait for life to get back to normal. And that could take months. You only have to look at the latest rise in cases to see we are not out of the woods. There are more than 15,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 across Canada. About half are in Quebec, more than 7,900 cases there. That province reported its biggest single-day rise in cases, 947. Another 4,000 are in Ontario, which jumped by more than 400 cases overnight. Alberta has confirmed more than 1,100 infections, and B.C. has at least 1,200. Four provinces, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador are all reporting more than 200 cases each. Nearly 300 people have died from the illness, but at least 3,000 people have recovered. Millions of Canadians have been seriously impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, whether they've been laid off or had to stop working. Federal government begins accepting applications for the CERB tomorrow. David Aiken joins us now to break down who this will help and why hundreds of thousands won't qualify. David? Robin, the applications for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit opens up Monday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern, and the government expects 3 million Canadians will apply in the next seven days alone. The CERB is a flat rate benefit of $500 a week. To be eligible, it doesn't matter how much you made, but you must have made at least $5,000 in income over the last 12 months. You must have lost all your employment income for 14 consecutive days anytime after March 15th, and you have to be an employee, self-employed, or a contract worker. The CERB will also replace employment insurance for the 2.1 million Canadians who applied for EI after March 15th. And for those Canadians, no matter how much money you might have qualified for under EI, you will automatically get $500 a week, the flat rate, no need to reapply. For millions, the CERB will mean a raise, but for many, it may mean a pay cut from the maximum EI benefit of $573 a week down to that flat rate of $500 a week. If you choose to direct deposit, you will get a first payment within three to five days. If you choose to receive your benefit by mail, you'll get money within the next 10 days. But hundreds of thousands will not qualify for the CERB, including those who had applied for or were receiving EI before March 15th, including those whose EI benefits are expiring. You will stay in the EI program. Those still working, but working only a few hours a week, any earned income disqualifies you from the entire $500 a week CERB. College and university students who have had summer job offers cancelled will not get the CERB. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said Sunday Ottawa plans to help students soon. This is an issue that we are very, very aware of, from uh, modifications to the Canada Summer Job Program to looking at uh, direct support for students. We know that we need to do more for young people as they come out of university. In the meantime, the government is ready to pay out the GST rebate on Thursday. And this rebate has been doubled to $400 per person or $600 per couple. You can get information on that payout plus the CERB at Canada.ca. Robin? David, another issue is face masks and this battle between the White House and Ottawa over the presidential order not to send the crucial N95 masks to Canada. How did the Prime Minister respond to that issue today and what was his tone? Well, Trudeau is still looking for a negotiated resolution, but Trump's move has angered a whole lot of people in Canada, including the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. That in a time of crisis, you don't stop being human. 
In 2001, our province stepped up in the biggest way possible. When the United States was in crisis after the terrorist attacks in New York, Newfoundland and Labrador accepted with open arms thousands of people from around the world. So today to say that I am infuriated with the recent actions of President Trump of the United States is an understatement. I cannot believe for a second in a time of crisis that President Trump would even think about banning key medical supplies to Canada. Now, Trudeau and Trump, by the way, have not yet talked about this. They're still leaving it up to their officials for now. Robin? David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. One of the biggest areas of concern in Quebec, a quarter of all nursing homes in the province have confirmed cases of COVID-19. It's hitting home for so many families with loved ones in long-term care. And as Amanda Jelowicki reports, they're weighing whether it's safer to get them out. Timothy Pereira placed his aging aunt in a Montreal nursing home just last week. The 72-year-old suffers from severe disabilities and needs professional care. But her residence has a COVID-19 outbreak. It's really tough to imagine that maybe the decision that I made to bring her there could end up with her dying. Doctors also told Pereira his aunt would likely get better emergency care at home. The doctor actually told me to come and pick her up and bring her home uh, and that she would be in, in a better situation. And I thought that was really disturbing. Pereira's situation is becoming a worrying, all too familiar refrain in Quebec. A staggering one quarter of all of Quebec's nursing homes have COVID-19 outbreaks. 60% of Quebec's 94 COVID-19 related deaths occurred in seniors' residences. The government has adopted stricter measures like banning visitors, but they're also changing policy quickly. On Thursday, Quebec's public health director said seniors were too vulnerable if they left nursing homes and went home. Friday, the government flip-flopped. So we did that, we discussed it very quickly yesterday, and we decided this is the way to go. Given the dire situation in seniors' residences, some experts say going home is the best option. If you have a healthy senior right now who's in a residence, I do strongly encourage people to go get them, find somewhere um, where it's going to be a little bit safer and where they can have a bit more attention paid to them. Many don't have that choice. Both Renee Menard's parents are in homes. She's worried she won't see them again. She is locked up in there. She can't even go out for a walk. We can't take her home because there are cases in the building, so we can't take her home. Um, so we're very worried. And with deaths rising each day, Families are terrified their loved one could be next. Amanda Jellowicki, Global News, Montreal. Another resident at a care home in Ontario, the site of an outbreak, has died. The total number of deaths is now 23 at Pinecrest Nursing Home in Bob Cajun. At least 24 staff members at the facility have also tested positive for COVID-19. The Coral Princess, with 100 Canadians on board, has docked in Florida. But they haven't been allowed to get off the cruise ship, while others have. There are cases of COVID-19 on the boat, but the cruise line insists none of the Canadians has this deadly virus. Here's Jennifer Johnson. After weeks at sea, the Coral Princess is now docked to Miami. Its voyage, a vacation that became a nightmare. Two passengers dying on board, a third in hospital, as others required stretchers to be carried off, sick with COVID-19. Gary Lyon and his wife Sue are from Toronto. They planned the trip to celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary on the cruise, but they are still stranded. We've been in our cabin since Tuesday. We've had meals brought to us to our door. They kind of drop them and run. I think what's frustrating right now, today, we're just not getting any updates. So we're not sure what's happening for the Canadians. Their voyage began exactly one month ago in Chile, and there was no talk of COVID-19 there. It was supposed to end two weeks ago in Argentina, but the ship was forced to sail for weeks as country after country refused an entry. On board, over 1,000 passengers and close to 900 crew members cut off and isolated as the COVID-19 pandemic took over the world. Miami's mayor finally offered a lifeline. Uh, it's unfortunate that on the on the way here, two two passengers died, and so for me it was okay. We got to take some people off that are in serious condition. We need to save some lives. As other cruises around the world returned to ports and future ones never departed, more passengers aboard the Coral Princess became ill. Grace and Peter Nam both tested positive for the virus. They got sick about two weeks ago. They were having symptoms of cold, fever. 
absolute nightmare. Health officials will eventually allow all those who are fit to fly home to leave through a closed-off terminal at Miami International Airport, fully masked. The sick are being sent to already crowded local hospitals. But for now, Canadian travelers still don't know when they'll be flown out or through what airport, just that upon their return home, they face 14 days in mandatory self-isolation. We're happy to follow them. We just need to be in Canada to follow them. Like so many others, anxious to be ending a vacation, they'll just be happy to survive. Jennifer Johnson, Global News. In New York, the death toll continues to climb. There have been more than 4,200 deaths, but there is some hope the spread is slowing. The state recorded a slight dip in fatalities today, but Governor Andrew Cuomo says it's too early to tell whether the pandemic has reached its peak. There were 594 deaths in the last 24 hours, down from 630 fatalities yesterday. The number of ICU admissions is also down. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been admitted to hospital as a precaution. He continues to show symptoms of COVID-19 since testing positive 10 days ago. The UK has suffered a record single-day spike in deadly cases of COVID-19. More than 700 people died in the last 24 hours. And despite lockdown warnings, people are venturing out into parks and socializing. Police are being forced to tell people to get back inside. Nearly 5,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the UK, and there are more than 48,000 confirmed cases. Queen Elizabeth delivered a rare national address today as cases of COVID-19 surge. She appealed to Britons to unite, to remain disciplined, and to stay home, describing this moment in time as one that will define the present and the future. I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. Together we are tackling this disease, and I want to reassure you that if we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. While we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavour. The Queen adds better days are to come. This is only the fifth time the Queen has delivered a special televised address in her 68-year royal reign, apart from her Christmas messages. The first happened at the beginning of the Gulf War in 1991. The second was after the death of Princess Diana in 1997. The Queen spoke again upon the death of her mother in 2002 and for her Diamond Jubilee in 2012. Coming up, a warning from researchers about rushing a vaccine. There's a big push around the world to find a vaccine, but there are fears a rush solution could bring on side effects and provide fuel for anti-vaxxers. Crystal Gomancing breaks down the complexity of creating a new vaccine. Billions of people are locked in their homes. One of the few rudimentary protections we have against a virus that's infecting and killing people at a record pace. It's this microscopic ball-like structure with its spikes that scientists are racing to decipher and defeat. How the virus actually docks and then fuses with the membrane, uncoats and then delivers its payload. And it's that whole viral life cycle that we try to understand. Jonathan Heaney is a Canadian scientist working at Cambridge University. His team is one of more than 40 registered with the World Health Organization pursuing a vaccine for COVID-19, even though we still know very little about the disease. Vaccines for coronaviruses have a very, very spotted history. In fact, it's very, very difficult to get an effective vaccine for coronaviruses. SARS and MERS are in the same viral family. They don't have vaccines yet either. A paper published in the official journal of the National Academy of Sciences highlighted past pitfalls that caused the immune system to backfire. One of the side effects, antibody-dependent enhancement. Essentially, the body makes it easier for the virus to invade. Officials in Ottawa said safety is the priority. We don't want to be vaccinating people and making it worse. Um, and there are a number of adverse outcomes that can happen if you move too quickly. Any severe uh, safety issues uh, will immediately trigger a review of that trial. But in the race to find a vaccine, regular drug testing steps are being combined. 
and work is progressing faster than ever. Vaccines in general are big money makers. A vaccine during a pandemic would be huge. Heaney doesn't want anything overlooked in the rush to get a product to market, which could feed the anti-vax movement. Our fear is that we'll get these nasty side effects and the public will get the impression that these are dangerous vaccines. As death tolls rise, people may become more accepting of risks associated with vaccines. But scientists like Heaney are calling for more worldwide collaboration and cautioning time is a necessity to get it right. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Still ahead, parenting postponed, the impact of COVID-19 on fertility treatments. The pandemic has forced all of us to put our lives on hold. For some Canadians, that includes the dream of having children. Fertility treatments have been postponed at clinics across the country. And as Karen Lieberman explains, that's causing more uncertainty for couples hoping to become parents. Much chin? Every day, four-year-old Isabella asks her mother when she's getting a baby brother or sister. Our daughter is constantly drawing pictures of you know babies in mommy's tummy, so she's so excited about having a sibling. A month ago, the Malarchicks of Oshawa, Ontario, had hoped they were one step closer to making that happen. We've been working at that now for a couple of years. The journey has been a long one. Three rounds of in vitro fertilization to conceive their daughter. A fourth round for a second child was unsuccessful. This year is when we said, you know what, let's give it our last go and we'll just do a fifth round, a final round. And if we get lucky, that's great. Finally, the news they've been waiting for, a viable embryo. Elena was ready to transfer right away. Then the coronavirus pandemic put everything, including fertility treatments, on hold. You have this moment where you're so excited you finally got that embryo because any fertility process is just about waiting and waiting and waiting and then we have to wait some more. Fertility clinics across the country shut down after the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society advised they suspend all diagnostic and elective procedures and surgeries and postpone new cycle starts other than for fertility preservation related to cancer treatment. This affects patients in the midst of or about to start treatments such as in vitro fertilization, intrauterine insemination and frozen embryo transfer. Our clinic, Geo Fertility, is fully physically closed. Um, all the 10 physicians, however, are still working actively, uh, talking to patients via telephone consultations. For couples struggling with infertility, the process is already emotional and uncertain. Sherry Cohen, who conceived her son with the use of an egg donor after four miscarriages, is hoping to help. There is this entire universe of women out there who were lonely, scared and afraid before, but now with the onset of COVID-19, um, they might have been in the middle of a cycle. They might have been gearing up with a drug protocol and now all of a sudden stopped dead in their tracks. Cohen holds virtual warrior infertility circles a way of bringing women together online and ensuring they feel supported. Infertility is a brutal journey for anyone to have to go through the best of times. And sadly, it strikes one in five of us. Elena Malarchik is anxious to implant her one last embryo to find out whether Isabella will get that sibling she longs for. I know a lot of women out there who have fertility issues, time is always the huge concern. But with no indication of how long fertility clinics will remain closed, the couple will have to wait to grow their family. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. Up next, the women leading Canada's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Leaders of all kinds are playing a huge role in the response to COVID-19. And in Canada, many of the key leaders are doctors who happen to be women. That's inspiring people across the country to find ways to honour these public health heroes. 
Based on the information available, cases are all There's Theresa Tam, Canada's public travelers. health officer. And there's a rationale for why we would... Bonnie Henry, BC's medical officer of health. This is not an overreaction. Dina Henshaw, in charge of the health of Albertans. They're doctors who deliver the disconcerting details about a virus that's taking lives. And they're all women leading the charge. That inspired a Calgary artist and an entrepreneur to put their faces on t-shirts to raise money for food banks. They swiftly sold out. These are women who are in science and it's about them being able to exercise their leadership in a in a time where we need that sort of that real combination of both data and science but also this caring compassion that they seem to manage to to tie together dear dr bonnie what to say to you two vancouver you roommates amy shire and vicky henderson wrote a song devoted to bc's medical officer of health they're all so qualified and competent and calm and they're giving you real information and factual information so by way of update? In Toronto, that city's public health officer is being honoured in a unique way, with a Twitter account for the scarves she wears daily, proving their style and substance. How many scarves do you have? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> These women certainly didn't have a following weeks ago. Now we know their names and we know who they are and we can recognize them. Yeah. Right? You have nice eyes and we just learned your name. Now they're front and center, not looking for stardom, but a solution to this crisis. And that is Global National. I'm Robin Gill. The NHL season was suspended this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but that didn't stop the go-to national anthem singer for Canucks games from belting out O Canada. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. Last night, singer Mark Donnelly did his part to keep spirits high, lending his voice to Vancouver's nightly cheer for health care workers. And we leave you tonight with some of that performance. Thank you for watching. Have a good night. Stand on guard for thee.